Marcelo, thank you so much for making time to share your insights into the future of leadership. But before we go into leadership, can you tell us where you're from and where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in, uh, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity, uh, Nick. Uh, I, I grew up in a small township called Kuma in uh, Tlaxstop in the northwest uh, of South Africa. Uh, and uh, it, it was a mining town uh, which uh, over the years has lost that uh, zest for, for, for life because when the mining uh, industry collapsed, uh, my township was... Uh, hard hit. In fact, the whole uh, community. Uh, community was hard hit. Um, I was born of a miner. My dad was a miner, uh, but uh, never t had uh, had much to do with my dad. Um, uh, raised by my single parent, my mom. Uh, so it uh, and and uh, she had six children um, that she made sure became responsible adults. Um, and of the six, uh, uh, she lost four of her children who died over the years. Um, and, uh, and now it's uh, me and a uh, uh, sister of mine, the, um, the fifth of the six children and the sixth one who, uh, who is left. So the last two uh, that she has. So uh, looking at my mom, I always say that uh, I'm born of strong stuff. Um, I'm born of uh, strong women. In my life, my grandmother was just as strong. Uh, when my mother used to be to this uh, domestic worker who, whenever she was off to do some work, we were looked after by my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, um, I always uh, admire the this, this spirit that she had, being my grandmother, uh, that uh, nothing was impossible. Uh, so she, she made sure that we also grew up to be who we are today. So as you grew up, Celo, what was your dream career? You know, I I, I thought of being a diplomat, mm -hmm. um, a career diplomat. Um, then uh, when I was in grade eight, I think, um, a teacher of mine came over and said, you know, you should try to uh, focus on careers that uh, do not have a lot of black people uh, because there you you, your chances of success are, are pretty huge. Um, coming from the apartheid times, that uh, uh, he emphasized that uh, there were some careers which were uh, which hadn't been ventured into by black people, and and uh, he planted a seed of being an archivist. Wow. Um, and uh, and I then started writing immediately. Wrote to the national archives to find out um, what you needed to to do to for you to be an archivist and they the I, I think the hr manager must have been looking at this thinking oh another one of these uh, young kids who are writing in uh, and and she just sent me this brochure and i i always had that um as something that I, that carried me to say that's what i want to be an archivist um and i'm happy that i i i, I then uh, focused on that because uh, i became one of very few, first few black people to be archivists in the country. In fact, the intake of the first uh, uh, archivists uh, in 2007 by the National Archives, I was part of that uh, uh, group of, uh, the, the, the uh, I think we were about five um, archivists. There were a couple other people who were already there, but we were this crop of, um, of, uh, of archivists that then joined in. Um, so I... I, I, I then became so passionate with that because uh, it, it then uh, rewarded me handsomely because um, I, I then got to be seconded by the National Archives to work with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Mm -hmm. um, I managed to also uh, help repatriate the archives of Namibia, um, which, as you know, was a protectorate of South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, so... It, read a lot about Namibia and South Africa's con uh, damage to the, the apartheid South Africa's damage of that country. Um, and uh, that's where the seed of uh, wanting to d uh, also contribute towards solidarity of the African continent uh, was planted. This could have been 1999. Um, so I, 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 I did some of that incredible projects um, uh, during that time.
And then this led you to the Nelson Mandela Foundation. Then my journey then uh, uh, led me to initially uh, to Vets University, where uh, which housed the South African History Archive. Um, I was then appointed uh, the the director of the South African History Archive. Um, and from from there, and, and again, we're doing some really revolutionary work, um, changing the landscape of archiving, building this uh, archive of uh, an activist archive, if you like, testing the boundaries of the law. How far can you push the uh, our transparency laws? Um, which is why I'm, I'm more keen on this very transparent uh, uh, governance system. Um, because I know the power of transparency. Um, it can help open uh, wounds, but also heal them. Um, uh, but those who want to forget, it helps them to forget if they so choose. And I'll give you one example. Uh, we did a, a, a project uh, at, at Saha, which was about um, uh, going to the military, the apartheid military archives. Um, and we approached people who had been terrorized by and traumatized, went through real trauma um, by the apartheid government, the apartheid military, who wanted to convert them uh, from being gay uh, to being straight, put them through all kinds of uh, uh, systems and uh, chemicals and all that. And we had one gentleman who th had asked us to... Um, to, to then uh, uh, request for his file. And the agreement with those that had uh, approached us was that uh, um, as soon as they had looked at the file, we would then make it public. Mm -hmm. So I, I gave him his file, he, which he looked through, and, uh, and I think the trauma and the pain was so much mm -hmm. that it opened wounds he didn't want to revisit. Uh, and he wrote to me, um, the, with the, 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 the absolute humility you could uh, imagine, he wrote to me, then said, um, having seen the file, I don't think I want uh, this uh, to be put out in the public mm -hmm. because the system actually hurt deeply. And now he was dealing with his demons from the past. Um, and I think we, the, the, the work that I did at the South African History Archive sort of taught me that you can allow people to forget if they so choose. But that if we don't deal with that kind of past, mm. we will remain a wounded nation. Mm. A nation that uh, would continue to struggle with its past and always arguing about a better past. Mm. Um, reminisce about the past in a way that says we could have made it better mm. without thinking how do we make a future that's better. Um, hence issues of homophobia, racism, and all kinds of discrimination resonate with me and they, they, they hit me hard because of that kind of uh, work that I did back then. Um, and, uh, and, and then moved on to the South African History Archive, uh, the South African uh, Human Rights Commission. Mm -hmm. And that's where I cut my teeth in communications uh, because I was uh, uh, appointed as head of communications there. And I'll forever be grateful for the kind of work that I did there again. Um, at the time that I decided to, to leave the, the South African Human Rights Commission, had, it was just at the time that uh, we had the xenophobic attacks of 2008. Mm. And I, I remember this, Nick, uh, uh, that, uh, that you, you, I just had my child, my son. Uh, the last born in my family, and uh, and uh, we went to a site where which was housing uh, um, refugees, basically people who had just been uh, uh, non-nationals who had just been kicked out of their f the, their communities by locals. And uh, what pained me most was a sight that I saw of uh, of how humanity can be bad. Human beings can be, can be ruthless, because mm. um, we we got to uh, this site in Jeppy, 
it was raining it was cold um and uh, and my son i think was said uh, three months old at the time um maybe two two to three months old and i saw this woman with a child who could have been my son's age uh, um my son was wrapped in blankets at home warm and here it was raining and cold they were living in this tent which was all wet muddy and and when i saw the sight of this child who uh, the mother was just trying to keep them warm from the cold winter night i got home and i decided i've seen the worst of humanity and um i think i need a break and that's when i decided uh, that it was time to leave uh, the human rights commission having done the incredible work that uh, they, they, that it opened doors for me to see things that i never thought um were possible to see and i i remember that uh, the ceo um at the time um uh, advocate sidi sotipanyan and i in fact shed tears mm. about how how did we come here how did we reach this stage as people uh, to be this ruthless you know and uh, and um, i then went over and said look i needed a break mm. and and it was then that uh, um, he advised that i not resign maybe take a break and during that time the, the nelson mandela foundation then approached me and said would i like to come and work here mm. um so i moved over as uh, head of communications here so is it fair to say looking back at the early stages of your career that your passion revolved around reconciling the past with the present in order to create a better future precisely i think you've uh, captured it well and i think um, uh, the the word of reconciling is is also heavy itself mm-hmm. because it suggests that you have made peace and you decided to 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 make peace with uh, with that past and and um, and i think uh, we we're not there yet mm. as a nation and I, i think as a people globally the kind of problems we have now of leadership at the moment um are mainly because people feel alienated to an extent that they think they would just uh, hedge their bets with uh, with whoever comes through as as a person they think will deal with that alienation and will reconcile the kind of difficult past they've had mm. with a future they want for their children and the kind of work that we should be trying to do now um uh, nick is to, is to try and and see how we can build nations build countries that can build for that future and mm. um, that we should imagine for those who are still to be born um because the stuff that we're doing today I'm not doing for my son who's 9 years old now but I'm trying to do it for his children's children um and I think that's the kind of passion that I have um and Nelson Mandela says that if there's one question that should bother each one of us every day um when we wake up in the morning is uh, what am I doing to help build a country of my dreams and that's that's the kind of passion that i have reconciling that past to try build kind of a, the, to to try make the present comfortable mm. for those who are uh, here now but kind of imagine what kind of future that the hopeful future that we can build for those who are still to be born now your passion of building a better world for the next generation was there or who was there a source of inspiration as you grew up you mentioned your grandmother you mentioned your teacher was there more sources of inspiration that informed your thinking about what uh, what later became your passion you know the the uh, the, the the thing I, sh- i i could say is that uh, i ended up with a with a hybrid of uh, of of role models um and as as you grow as i grew up certainly i ended up picking up more and more mm. and um, one that comes to mind immediately is uh, is uh, dadesoli manyaka 
someone I, I looked up to and I, I, I continue to look up to who who, who sort of uh, took me to, to a project. I think it was 2000. It could have been 2000, 99, 2000 on land reform. And I remember that so clearly in my mind because we drove in his car and throughout he was telling me how um, actually the work that we're doing now could be the kind of work that would change things for the future in, 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 in the future where you're trying to, to say to people you, you must work hard to own land. You must uh, work hard to root yourself somewhere and once you've put that uh, uh, stick on, on the ground to say this is where I am uh, we should be able to then try build uh, the kind of future we want so I've, 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 I've had many many uh, people who've inspired me in, in my life um, I uh, what many people don't know is that uh, I, I, I started off wanting to be a priest so I, a Catholic priest I went to the seminary and um, I think within t t uh, a month, uh, or three months rather, I, t I then just thought, no, this is not for me. Uh, there's another calling out there. Um, I can make a difference differently. But the second reason I, I, I made the choices I made was because I grew up in this poverty. And I could see for my family, I was the last hope. Mm. Uh, so I was the first graduate in my family. And... Um, and I, I, I remember going to to Father Girard and telling him, look, and I spoke to another f uh, priest there, Father, Father Mutziri, and I called him and told him, look, I, I, I don't think this is me. Mm -hmm. Then I went for teaching. Um, I taught for a couple months. Mm -hmm. and again, it was not me. Mm -hmm. um, so, so people around me just started influencing decisions that I was making from my uncles to... Um, to people like Jomo Sono, who's, uh, who's uh, t uh, one of our legends, soccer legends, and, and who owns Jomo Cosmos. And people like those then started inspiring me to, to say, no, man, there's a different way. Mm. There, there should be an alternative world we can build. Now, looking back at your life, um, Sarah, would you say there was one or maybe two turning points where your life could have gone into a different direction, but... You decided to take it this way. That's a difficult question. Um, um, I think that the I said the first turning point um, could have been when I, when I lost my brother, the 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 brother I followed. Um, um, and I, I like telling the story because I, I think something uh, there's something significant that uh, might have happened in my life then. So I I I, I was walking the street the street of uh, uh, in Pretoria, um, having uh, gotten a call for from home to say my brother had died, mm. and um, and I remember sitting there in 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 the office in, in at the National Archives finishing off an assignment just lateish. Um, finishing off this assignment, which was submitting for my postgrad at, at Vets University, so I, I I then decided just finish it, you know, because uh, if you stop, you now have to go back to your professors and tell them, hey, a dog ate my 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 homework kind of story. So so I then just uh, decided to submit it, and I found myself in this deep hole. Um, being pained, feeling like I'd been soaked um, in blood, um, and uh, and I walked out of the National Archives, uh, walking on the street, and uh, it, it it's as I said, it's it was now dark, and uh, the next thing I hear a voice singing um, the song of uh, "No Woman No Cry." Mm. I don't know if you know the song. Um, and uh, as I get closer and closer, uh, the voice keeps singing and uh, it gets to the chorus as I'm about to, to pass this man. 
and says everything is going to be all right. And it gets to that everything is going to be all right. He repeats and everything is going to be all right. And I finally get to see this man and it's a, it's a homeless man who's preparing his bed for the night. And I thought, you know, yes, I've lost my brother, but this guy has nothing. Yet he believes that everything is going to be all right. And immediately thereafter, I, I, I fell seriously sick, um, having buried my brother. I think I was grieving for too long. And uh, and um, at some point, my mom, I think, had, had uh, almost given up that I was going to die too. Um, and the, the turning point there was when I went to this doctor, Malulek in Mamelodi, who then told me, I'm not going to prescribe anything for you. I can see that you've gone through all kinds of medication and uh, you've lost so much weight and you actually have an ulcer and it's caused by stress because um, I had told him what had happened he said no it's grieving for, for your brother now something that you need to turn around because uh, it will end up killing you, you know, so, so my first turning point was, was caused by grief when I realized you can either mourn forever um, or just pick up the pieces and go from where he left off. And that's what I did. Um, and I think uh, um, it took me about two weeks maybe, uh, from my recollection, maybe a month, and I was 100%. I've never had ulcers again. You know, so... So you, it, uh, that was for me a, a serious turning point. The, and I, I and and if anything, a lesson from back then is one shouldn't make stress part of your life. Mm. Stress is stress. Mm. You can either stress about it, or you can make it just something that is is real to just be dealt with mm. um, because of a phase. That you're going through, you're going some through some phase, and that's stressful, but it shouldn't define who you are, because sometimes it can be fatal. So, Selo, what would you say is driving you today? Youth. I think uh, I was asked this question uh, about two years ago. We we had uh, young people here. What I'd say, cream de la cream of. Uh, of uh, of young people in South Africa and and uh, the question that was asked was what uh, what gives you sleepless nights mm. and the one thing that gives me sleepless nights is alienation of young people mm. we're breeding a generation of young people who who have nothing to live for remember that in 1964 Madiba said something about what he was willing to die for mm. never mind dying for something but living for it mm. and it's, it's this generation that I'm worried about and that gives me that that pushes me every morning to say what have I done today to make a difference in one child's life in one young person's life whether it be through literacy projects that I get involved with um, sanitary pads that we, we provide to young girls. Um, by 2020, I would, I would wish to have two million girls permanently in school, never having to think about sanitary pads. Mm. Um, uh, how how am I contributing towards uh, uh, ensuring that there's hope, even in situations and circumstances which are dire? Mm. Um, because it's when you have young, uh, hopefully young people that your nation has a chance mm. to to succeed. So for me, it's um, and and the the another reason that um, I wake up in the morning is uh, ensuring that I fly the South African flag high. Mm. Um, I fly the African flag high. Mm. Um, but in there is contained a deeper mes message of saying all of us have a responsibility to be active citizens in our nations, in our countries. Um, we shouldn't sit back and say it's someone else's responsibility. Mm. 
it's ours and it should be something that we hold on to every time so Selo, when you speak to the youth to aspiring leaders what is it you tell them they should focus on i i always uh, try try to tell young people find the hero within you know there the, the is that hero within um i've just come back from summit in kilimanjaro uh, which i did last month um in july and and uh, and and the, the two reasons i i did it um, uh, besides everything else I, uh, i i i bound myself to doing it for the tutu fellowship um because i'm a tutu fellow and uh, as part of the fellowship i i then made a pledge that i will climb kilimanjaro every year or for as many times from then which was 2015 um uh, until 2020 and during this this time i would have raised enough money f- as i said for two million girls i i remember as uh, the two reasons sorry let me go back there it, it one was uh, i lost a friend uh, going up kilimanjaro uh, in 2016 Uh, someone I had recruited to climb Kilimanjaro um, and uh, and I, I I then the second reason was uh, to help preserve Madiba's legacy uh, to grow uh, this legacy and uh, and and for me if there's anything that I I I'd like to tell young people is it's when you are in the extreme conditions in 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 the extreme difficult uh, uh, under difficult difficulties that there is that hero within you that emerges sometimes we think that um, we're traveling alone but there's someone else who's traveling with us within who's keeping us going and until such time that you define the why you do something until such time you define clearly and find that uh, uh, that hero within but also to always differentiate we we we, s- we struggle and I, i remember when kilia told my fellow climbers one thing that I, i i did when when i climbed the first time in 2015 was to always remind myself that there's a difference between being sick when you cannot continue with the journey because you are unwell genuinely unwell i cannot continue and being tired and most of the time we confuse the two when you tired it means you can still keep going because uh, um, the journey ahead sometimes is it's so short as compared to where you come from and and we we sometimes forget that it could be that the end is just around the corner and we quit too soon because we are tired we are not unwell and it's that hero within that then keeps telling you another step bring you brings you closer to the goal but because you know the goal and you know the why that step keeps going saying keep going keep going at it and and i think um uh, that's the one thing that i always say to young people i think it's important that you you then define that why so clearly that the purpose is so clear uh, that your your mind will be focused on that goal and you'll always just keep going for it and um and then the the last thing i i tell them is uh, is about hope um You know there's a there's a this uh, a hero of mine uh Vatlav Havel um who who gave a, a speech and it I wish I could uh, read it um uh, because uh, I'll, I'll, I I I I'll, I'll just paraphrase him um and he was giving a speech at a conference that was attended by Madiba also um and uh, uh, my mentor Leon Vessel um the 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 conference was uh, titled the anatomy of hate and he was then talking about hope um within this uh, thing of uh, how how you deal with hope with hate um and hatred uh, rather 
So he then uh, says that I'm not an I'm not a, an a, an optimist because I don't believe that everything ends well. I, neither am I a, a pessimist because I don't believe that everything ends badly. All I carry with me, with me is hope. Hope is the belief that uh, things will come right, no matter what the circumstances. He says that it's a God-given gift. You either have it or you don't. And he says, when you don't have hope, you are as good as dead. Because it's the one thing that can carry you through. And I always say to young people, our circumstances sometimes lie to us. That this is it. It's over. But it's to remember, no. It's, it's, it's the now that I'm faced with. But the future uh, can get better. And growing up keenly again, it's a, it's a lesson that you learn. Uh, having walked for uh, nine, ten hours, that the sun will rise. Um, you walk through this dark night, cold, freezing cold. Um, and the one thing that gives you hope is when you see those, uh, the, 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 this orange, bright orange coming up because you know there's hope, there's, uh, there's warmth. Something is about to happen beyond this thing. And, and, and then in no time you reach your summit. Now, Selo, looking into the future, as humanity seems to enter a new era, as technology is changing faster and faster, what does the future of leadership mean to you? Nick, if there's one thing that worries me every day is also how we're lagging in terms of leadership. Uh, we we have we're lagging behind in terms of how we define leadership, how we we even look at people we call leaders. Um, at the moment, I feel that mediocrity is promoted over excellence. Uh, that the most mediocre tend to be the ones that we promote to being um, what we regard as the best. And you, it, and here I'm not just talking about politics. It's in all spheres of life that the the, the future ahead demands that. We not talk about young people and young people's issues, but that we promote young people's causes and promote young people to drive those causes. Because leadership lies in those that uh, have the responsibility to ensure that the kind of present that they have changes for the better. And at the moment, I, 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 I worry that we hold on too, too much. Um, as the older generation holds on too much into leadership and, uh, and they, they then don't just give the reins to trust enough in young people to say, you can do it without us. The board of the Nelson Mandela Foundation took a massive risk when they appointed me as chief executive of the Nelson Mandela Foundation. I was 37 years old, um, which uh, is considered young. For, for leading an institution as big as this, um, with an international profile that it has, the kind of people that come through the door any other day, um, and the full spectrum that you have to change lives of those who are discarded, the forgotten, the marginalized, but also mixed with the elite, mix it with the elite so that the elite then help you change these lives. So I think uh, the future leaders are in young people and we should let them lead now. Um, I, I, I attend conferences where uh, young people become the subject uh, of discussion and they are not in the room. You know, and we talk about them with them being outside. And we never even bother to just say, come in and just tell us what bothers you most. And, and I think uh, if there's one thing that I would plead uh, for us to change in terms of any kind of uh, leadership roles and leadership, uh, um, whether it be entrepreneurship, etc., we must always just put young people forward. 
Marcelo, in your mind, what role can technology play to for leadership? Hmm. You know, the the, uh, the the one thing that has changed everything in terms of how we, we view ourselves is technology. Technology has uh, changed how how we even perceive um, the kind of future we want. Uh, uh, my wife and I had this discussion t- a, f- a few days ago. We were looking at a power bank. Um, we attended an event uh, where they gave us this small power bank. And I remember uh, both of us thinking, we've made it. To now even have a power bank, you know, that you can charge off. Today, technology has made it. That power bank that we got, the reason we were having that discussion is that we were holding it. I found it in my stuff. I'm an archivist and I collect anything and everything. So so I found that and I, and I, I, I then look at the leap, quantum leap from what was, what, four or five years ago to today. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think, uh, if anything, leaders must keep tapping onto that to say, how do we reach young people in the medium that they understand better. My nine-year-old can, can navigate his way through a phone better than I can. And, and I think uh, uh, until such time that uh, we do the difficult work of speaking to and, uh, and using tools um, that young people understand we're going nowhere. And maybe even to give way, um, uh, uh, Eleanor Sisulu, and I'm, I might spoil what she, how she describes it, but she says uh, there's uh, uh, the technology natives and the immigrants. Mm. Uh, we are immigrants, uh, and the natives need to now teach us how to mm. use uh, these technologies, and we must uh, believe in them enough. And I think technology um, is something that uh, we, we should be able to tap into to change lives into the future. Well, but it can also be used for bad, too. Um, if you look at the issues of nuclear um, and experts coming forward saying you don't need to be producing more nuclear, um, we must continue to be a lis- listening people uh, about the cautions of what we might destroy as the future. Now, Selo, in your work with young people, can you maybe share a success story or two where you help the youngster, maybe you inspired them, Maybe you open the door for them and they achieve great success. I think one one such young person that I have worked with and I continue to work with, uh, and he's taken it upon himself to uh, also make a difference in the lives of others, is a young man called Tabiso Chauke. Um, Tabiso and I met a few years ago, and uh, I remember when I met him, my, my kids just wanted him to teach them karate, because that was his passion. Today he's in the intelligence world. Today he's uh, he continues to to study further, which was the one thing that I kept on drumming in his head to say, uh, you never stop. Um, he he he's an orphan. He's uh, he's got he he's got a story that can make our stories combined just look like the uh, Mickey Mouse and what we call problems. And today he's a hopeful young person who's, uh, who's, uh, whose career is uh, beginning to flourish. When you speak to the next generation, who are the role models that you refer to they should maybe learn from or take a leaf from? You know, the... the Role models are a difficult thing to define for others. And I, I always say to, to young people, you have to define the kind of future you want because that future is contained and you can see that future through the eyes of your role model. Um, if, you, if you take on a role model, a criminal as a role model, that's how your future looks like. The future has cars, it has wealth, but it's fake wealth. It's wealth that can disappear tomorrow. It's, it's wealth that uh, the, 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 their eyes should be that reflector that says, 
I don't want to end like that. The start could be good because maybe you have a big hit at the beginning. But the end is what you should worry about because you see it through their eyes. And uh, and and if you look at the, of course, I, I always refer back to, to Madiba. Um, uh, Madiba is uh, the ultimate hero in my life. Um, and I, I refer them to, to to someone who whose values are so universal that even when it, at the time that we live in, these times that we live in when, where everything is justifiable, you can justify and anything and everything, there's things that are, are stable um, and values are. And Madiba would carry those kind of values that we, sh we could uh, look up to. But, um, and I also tell them, Within your own families, there are, there are heroes there. Find heroes within. Sometimes we, we look out for heroes instead of drawing from the same river where we are. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I use my mother, for example, and say that uh, you look at my mother, you look at my grandfather, my, my, my grandmother. Uh, those are people that you should then be looking inside. Yes, they are flawed as all of us are. Um, I mean, my, my mother, had, uh, my grandmother, they, 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 they lived difficult lives which had many flaws that I look back and say, that was really flawed, mm. but they covered it well with their character of being strong people who were always trying to make my life better. Now, Selo, speaking about Madiba, at the unveiling ceremony for what was a Sulu, he said these famous words that let us build a nation of champions. What is it that you suggest everybody can do, should do, to help build a nation of champions? You know, in 2008, uh, Madiba said, uh, the world remains beset by so much human suffering, poverty, inequality, disease. It is in your hands to help build a better world. And I think that world is what all of us should uh, try to do in ourselves. In other words, we should not always wait to be led. Leadership is about also seeing opportunities for you to lead. And I think uh, the more leaders that we produce who believe that they can do good, the better. Um, to tell you another another anecdote that um, uh, there was uh, uh, when 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 uh, I, I recently saw Gugu Zulu's uh, mom. Gugu Zulu is uh, the friend of mine who died on the mountain, and I saw his uh, his mom, um, and uh, and um, uh, she had just lost her husband when I saw her, and she said, you know. If there's one thing I learned in marriage, is, uh, and, in, and, and it apl applies in any relationship, she said, is that always try to be good. Because my husband, at the time of him dying, and he was so sick, and I, I looked after him for all these years, he, he one day he looked at me and he said, you know, I'm so happy that I was a good husband. Because today I'm reaping the rewards of being good. And the rewards of being good citizens, of being people who are always investing in, uh, in, in processes, in people, in, in, uh, in your own country, is that um, the rewards come later in those that will look up and say, aren't we lucky to have had good parents? Yeah, so aren't we lucky to have had good leaders? Now, Selo, where can people follow you? How can they connect with you? Um, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm on uh, all social media platforms with the uh, exception of one or two. So I'm on Twitter as Selo.Hatang uh, and on um, Facebook as Selo Hatang and uh, on Instagram also as Selo Hatang. So you can follow me there. Those are the main ones that I, I, I use. Um, I used to have a LinkedIn account. I don't know if it's still on. I haven't been there for a while. But uh, those are, that, that's, uh, that's the best way to get hold of me.
and say, Lord, last but not least, is there one piece of advice that you would give to aspiring leaders they should implement in their life? Carry hope. Uh, because it's when you carry hope that you give others hope. Um, be the person that y- you want others to be. In other words, to see in you, sorry. So they should see in themselves um, what you give them. If you are a ray of sunshine and, uh, and light, people feel light around you. Thirdly, exude good energy all the time. There's nothing that's so bothersome than a heavy leader. Um, Someone who's always uh, complaining and never showing gratitude for the kind of work that others are doing around them. Um, Fourthly, know that you are not the only one leading. Those that you are leading are leaders too. And find in them the good that you can then also try to to then uh, uh, help nurture be a nurturing leader in other words but leaders never think about today only they must always be thinking about the future what kind of future do you want don't think legacy first in terms of how you 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 want to be remembered because that's out of your control um how people remember you but do enough for people to know he had an impact and they can then define the person that you were. Well, Dr. Sello, thank you so much. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Nick. You are an incredible inspiration and I think you're doing incredible work in uh, carrying forward Madiba's legacy and doing it in a very practical way, in a way that I think people can see, they can touch and, uh, and, and there's hope. Thank you. So thank you so much. Thank you very much and I wish you all the best.